in this lesson, we're going to be talking about the structure of water and hydrogen bonding. I may be looking towards the screen because I do have some speaker notes that I'm going to look at. But in the AP Bio uh, categorization of like what you have to know, I broke it up into the skill, learning objective, and essential knowledge. The topic today is the structure of water hydrogen bonding. And then the next one will be elements of life. In this one, we do have a good chunk of information that is uh, not necessarily related to 1.1, but uh, gives you the precursor knowledge to understand it. So the skill by the end of this is to describe characteristics of a biological concept, process, or model represented visually. That one, the skill we're gonna develop in the actual in-class or synchronous learning sessions, um, whether that happens through Zoom or Google Meet. And the learning objective of this is to explain how properties of water result from its polarity, hydrogen bonding, and how that affects its function. So the three essential knowledge uh, points I would write down, and as we talk about the lesson today, figure out how the content that you're learning fits into the essential knowledge. But we'll begin with elements and compounds, something that's pretty basic in terms of understanding this unit but it ties it back to chemistry and it helps you see how chemistry relates to biology. So what we do know is that organisms are made up of matter. Matter is the physical substance. Um, think of it like, uh, it's like from the Oxford languages, I just copied the definition and it said, physical sub substance in general, um, as distinct from mind and spirit. So think of it like separate from something like your mind, spirit, something like philosophical. Think of it like physical substance, so something that occupies space, like your body, like a rock, um, like the different organisms that you see on the picture to the left, that tree, that rat, or the mouse. Um, all of those are made up of matter, something that is uh, that takes up physical space. And something that's often missed is that gases are actually uh, also examples of matter. And an element is a substance that can't be broken down into other substances by chemical reactions. And when you start combining two or more elements, you get a compound. So an element, think of that like sodium or chloride. And then a compound would be sodium chloride or table salt. An atom is the smallest unit of matter that have fundamental properties of a chemical. A compound, distinct groups of atoms held together by chemical bonds. So think of it like you have a hydrogen atom. So it is the smallest unit of matter, cannot be broken down anymore, and it has the properties of a chemical. Um, you have hydrogen, two of them, and you have an oxygen, and then you hold, you hold them together by a covalent bond and you get H2O, water. And you're able to say water molecule, but it changes. So we have uh, sodium chloride right here. You can't say sodium chloride molecule. The reason why is because molecule only relates to uh, covalent bonding. So that's important to distinguish. You don't say sodium molecule because that is a different type of compound that is held together. That would be called a formula unit. So you would call a uh, sodium chloride like formula unit. This is a video that talks about the properties of elements. I'm not going to dive into it. Um, it's more for you to watch. So I would pause it, watch it. It dives deep into uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, what an atom is, property makeup, subatomic particles. So it's good review from chemistry and it helps you with your overall understanding of AP Bio. And some more properties of elements. We have 92 elements, but of the 92, 25 are essential to life. And there are really four that are pretty critical. Um, they are carbon, We'll talk about a lot about carbon in the next uh, section. Oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. So of those, they make up 96% of living matter. And some that are important too are phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, potassium. They make up like the other 4%. So together that's like 100% of living matter. The other ones are trace elements, um, which are essentially minute, required in minute quantities. So think of it like iron and iodine. And something that's interesting is I want you to look up what these are used for. Um, I could tell you, but I want you to think about that. And then, 
pause this and then watch it. So I'm going to give you a second to pause it. And then um, you should have found that one of the uh, uses of a trace element of iron, think about your hemoglobin, um, iron bonds to binds to oxygen and it's really important in our body. Mm -hmm. Iodine, um, think about your thyroid and uh, research into that. So here's another video that can help you out with like atomic structure, number, isotopes. So in an element, when you're looking at the periodic table, there are these numbers. Um, it's important to understand what those numbers are and how to read the periodic table. But atom, it's kind of a review, smallest unit with properties of its element. Um, and they're made up of essentially subatomic particles like protons, neutrons, electrons. And the protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus, whereas the electrons are found on the outside. Um, not necessarily in a confined orbital, but more like a dense cloud of electrons. So they kind of just move around in a cloud. And just some more trivial things that I'm not going to uh, like have you memorize, but it's important that you know. Um, it essentially highlights how light they are. So if you look at it, it's 1.7 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. So that's tiny, so small that they have to uh, essentially have a unit for that, which is Dalton or a conversion for that. So one Dalton is equivalent to about this. Here's another video talking about electron energy levels. So I would dive into this video uh, because it is important um, to understand the different varying energy levels uh, of electrons. Here's one on covalent bonding. And uh, covalent bonding is going to be talked a lot about in terms of uh, hydrogen bonding. So we'll dive into that. Chemical bonding. Uh, there are some weak ones, so the strongest bonds is a covalent bond. Um, you should have found that out from the video that you just paused and watched. And they are very strong. It's hard to break a covalent bond, whereas a weaker bond is super easy to break. Now these have a lot of advantages. Um, so for example, one advantage or benefit is it's reversible. So think about like the undo redo button um, on Microsoft Word or Google Docs. It's kind of the same way. It can undo, it can uh, redo and it allows for bonding that's like really quick. So ionic bonding, hydrogen bonding are two examples. And in ionic bonding, this video is going to help you out on that one. Hydrogen bonding, this video will help you out, but I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about it. It's essentially when the hydrogen forms uh, or bonds with an electronegative atom. We're going to be talking about this in the context of oxygen and hydrogen a lot and how that uh, allows water molecules to interact. And let me find my speaker notes. Okay. So one of the most common uh, hydrogen bondings are water and ammonia. Uh, we'll be talking about the water one specifically, but after we finish the water, make a note inside your notes to go back to uh, thinking about how ammonia now relates to that. And this one's a pretty interesting one. So this is a gecko. Um, and it's essentially like sticking to the wall. And if you notice, like they don't have like suction cups on their hands or their uh, fingers, whatever they, um, on their hands and their feet, I would just call it that. But essentially because the electrons are always moving, it creates this asymmetrical charge. Um, think about like polar and nonpolar. So it has a polar charge and it results in hot spots of positive and negative charges. These allow it to stick to one another in a super weak interaction. So think about like the hands of the gecko, it is charged and that's why it's able to stick to other surfaces uh, with a super weak charge interaction. But it can literally climb up walls. This is a chemical reaction, um, and it's not. It's essentially related to uh, just your overall understanding of bonds breaking and changing. So, a chemical reaction does have a defined uh, name for it or definition to it, and it's making or breaking of chemical bonds, and that's where most people stop. Um, 
But another aspect of it that's important is that it relates to a composition change. So it's a chemical reaction when the making or breaking of bonds lead to a composition change. Um, so one example is right here. So we have carbon dioxide plus water leads to sugar and oxygen. And you've probably seen this before, um, something that needs light. So think about photosynthesis. So we have uh, carbon dioxide, plants take in carbon dioxide, plants need water. And with light, it, it produces sugar, glucose, and oxygen. The oxygen's for us, the glucose is for the plant. And if we were to reverse this, then we would have cellular respiration, where we take in oxygen and our body consumes uh, sugars, breaks it up, and as a result, we produce water and carbon dioxide. So um, this is a chemical reaction because it leads to a composition change. And uh, sometimes people get caught up in the fact that, oh, what, we produce water? Um, if you don't believe me or science, uh, take your hand and just breathe on your hand. And so the, what accumulates on your palms is the moisture from that water. And a chemical equilibrium is when reactions offset one another. So think of it like they're going back and forth um, at the exact same rate because they're at equilibrium. That's where they want to be. So an example of, uh, sorry, getting messages. An example of chemical equilibrium is uh, hydrogen and nitrogen to form uh, NH3, which is ammonia. So ammonia can form at the same exact rate that ammonia is uh, broken down or decomposed. And this would be a chemical equilibrium. And this symbol right here, or not necessarily a symbol, but a uh, symbol. So you have the arrow going back and forth. That is the symbol for a chemical equilibrium. So when you see that, you know that they are in equilibrium. Okay, so this is the section 1.1 stuff that is important. And the previous stuff helps to understand this section right here, or the content here. So water, it's one oxygen, two hydrogen, H2O. Something that's essentially uh, self-explanatory through its chemical formula. And it's bonded through covalent bonds. Um, this is important to note because remember, covalent bonds are one of the strongest bonds. Um, so it's that that's to say that it's difficult to break the hydrogen from the oxygen. And there are electrons because it's in covalent bond. They're essentially sharing the electrons. The electrons are in a cloud around H2O. Uh, we can show it inside a structured way. You'll see that inside the next slide. But just know that there's a bunch of electrons and they're in clouds. So it's important to study where those electrons are and where they prefer to be in that cloud when thinking about H2O. And it's prevalent in our cells. So one reason why it's so important. Another reason, Earth is made up of majority water. Sorry, there's a plane outside. Okay, 71% of Earth is water. So if the majority of the Earth is water, that should be a strong indication of the importance of water. This is the property of water. So in order to understand the water property, we have to dive deep into oxygen and hydrogen. So we have water molecules here, H2O, you have two hydrogens, covalently bonded to an oxygen. So they're sharing electrons right here, sharing electrons, and oxygen is highly electronegative. So electro, electronegative is essentially um, the atom's ability to attract electrons. So think of that like it's attraction factor, it's really high. It, uh, electrons, when they see oxygen, they would rather be with oxygen than a less electronegative atom. So it's super highly electronegative. And as a result, remember when I said that there were floating electrons in the cloud, in the dense electron cloud? Um, so what's gonna happen is that the electrons are going to uh, have a stronger affinity to the more electronegative atom. That's oxygen. So if you can imagine a bunch of, think about my cursor like the electrons, it's floating. And if my cursor were like one electron, where it would prefer to be is with the oxygen. So it'd be right here. 
So the electrons hover uh, more likely towards the oxygen. As a result, that results in a partial negative charge around the oxygen, and the partial negative comes from the electron. So that symbol right there is an indicator for partial uh, charge. So it has a partially negative charge because of its uh, ability to attract electrons. Because the electrons are hovering around the oxygen, that means that the electrons are not as hovered around the hydrogen. Hydrogen, as a result, has a more positive charge. So we have a partially negative charge on the oxygen and a partially positive charge on the hydrogen. Now, this is where the interactions are important. Uh, because it has partial charges, that's something called polarity. So polarity is essentially where uh, there are partial charges within the atoms of a molecule. So you could, you would say that water is a polar molecule. So if you look at all of these little water uh, molecules that I drew here, we know that oxygen is partially negative and we know that hydrogen is partially positive. Now when you're thinking about just one water molecule, it's not a huge deal. But once you start putting a bunch of water molecules together, you have a negative charge on the oxygen and you have positive charge on the hydrogen. Negative and positive charges attract. So as a result, you have negative and positive wanting to bond right here. And you have negative and positive wanting to bond right here. So you have a bunch of potential bonds or matchmaking areas uh, around here. So because of the opposite partial charges, they are going to want to bond and they bond in a way that's called hydrogen bonding. So that's hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is a direct result of the polarity of the water molecule. And we're going to dive into this afterwards, but this is called cohesion. So they are cohesing. I'm pretty sure that's not a word, but they are wanting to bond to each other and water molecules are attracting each other. And that's how you get like coagulated water molecules or water molecules that go into a puddle. Uh, just think about a bunch of hydrogen bond bonds occurring because of these partial charges, because of its polarity. And a slide to talk about the polarity importance even more. Polarity leads to interaction of water molecules, hydrogen bonding. It's in red, it's important. Uh, polarity allows for the interactions in the water molecules. And that's a direct result of the hydrogen bonding. The polarity allows the water to be a solvent. Um, so a solvent is the ability for uh, something to dissolve another. So it is actually called the universal uh, solvent. So that means that water can dissolve a lot of different things, many different things. And we're going to be talking more about polarity, I believe, in the next slide. Or not polarity, uh, solvent in the next slide. Polarity also allows it to regulate its temperature. Polarity allows the structure uh, and its structure impacts the properties in evaporative cooling, surface tension, adhesion, and cohesion. We'll be talking about that too in the slide that's coming up. So it's important to understand that water does all of these things. I'm not going to be talking about how it regulates temperature, but I want you to really think about how it can do that. And I want you to research that and put that into your notes. Okay, so let's talk about the solvent section. So we have, we're gonna be looking at two pictures. The first picture is this one. We have oil and water. Oil and water do not mix. I want you to pause this video and think about why. Okay, so now that you've written down something, hopefully, um, let's talk about why. So water we talked about is a polar molecule. It has partial charges. Um, oil is a nonpolar molecule. So because it is nonpolar, that means it doesn't have an imbalance of internal charges. So just like how oxygen has that partial negative and hydrogen has that partial positive, um, oil doesn't have a partial charge in its uh, in its uh, chemical structure. So let me go ahead 
um, can't pull up a picture fast enough, but just think about fats, lipids. Um, it has essentially a lot of carbons and hydrogens, very stable, no charge. Um, and because it doesn't have a charge, uh, there's no electrostatic interaction that occurs between water and oil. So another way to think about it is, remember how the negative, uh, partially negative oxygen interacted with the partially positive hydrogen? Because it has that charge difference, um, there's no electrostatic interaction that's going to occur between water and oil. So it's just going to stay separate in like a hydrophobic layer. Now, this picture right here. So what that picture is showing, so we have a crystal of uh, sodium chloride, crystal of table salt. So just think about like table salt. You stick it into water. Now you have salt water. You don't see the crystal of table salt anymore. So what that indicates is that water is a solvent because it dissolved in it, uh, dissolved that substance. So if we really think about why, we have chloride, we have sodium, the purple. Uh, they're bonded into this like lattice structure and it's very stable. Now when you put it into water, it separates. And it separates, when it separates, you have a chloride that has a negative charge. You have a sodium that has a positive charge. And if you look at these two pictures, we have a hydrated sodium ion. What that means is that the positive charge in the sodium is going to interact with the oxygen, which has a partial negative. So there is an electrostatic interaction between the oxygen and the nitrogen. And if you look at the chloride, so the chloride has a negative charge and the hydrogen has a positive charge. And these are going to want to interact. So essentially what you get is uh, just an interaction between the charges of the water with the charges of the sodium and the charge of the chloride. And it's essentially dissolved into this hydrated uh, picture right here where you see that the water wraps around each of the individual ions. And there's actually another name for that. That's called a hydration shell. So think of it like a shell around uh, the ions. So the water molecule is engulf, is like surrounding uh, these right here, these ions, and it's preventing them from forming back together into a stable sodium chloride. So that's how it essentially is a solvent. It's a solvent because of the polarity of water. It's a solvent because of the partial charges of water. So the chemical properties of water really uh, impact how it interacts with different ions, which is really cool because you can look at the structure of water and you can assume things about how it would interact with uh, ions. Now let's go into hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is a result of the polarity. So that's the first one. And because it interacts with the water molecule, uh, you get cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. So diving into those three definitions, we have cohesion, which is intermolecular forces that hold solids and liquids together attraction of molecules. So cohesion and adhesion are kind of uh, confused sometimes because adhesion is the ability of a substance to stick to an unlike substance. They're, they're both related to sticking and that's where a lot of people get confused because cohesion and adhesion both relate to sticking. But so what's the difference? So here's a quick way to memorize it. Cohesion like molecules. So sticking with like molecules. Adhesion ability of a substance for an unlike so it's unlike molecule so if you were to think about it um, cohesion is occurring with these water droplets right here so water is uh, hydrogen bonding to each other the oxygen and the hydrogen of two different water molecules interacting forming droplets that's cohesion adhesion is the ability of that water droplet or the water molecules to stick to the leaf or the grass um, so when you see water like droplets, cohesion. When you see it sticking to something, adhesion. And then surface tension. Um, so essentially surface tension is uh, tension of film caused by attraction of particles. Um, 
So think about like the water molecules interacting with each other in cohesion. Okay, so you've got cohesion, water is essentially interacting with each other, and then you have water now. Um, so when you, when something breaks into the water, you have to essentially separate the hydrogen bonds, and it has like tension to that because bonds, even though they're weak, they're still there. So there's tension that's occurring and you have to break those bonds before you break through the water or surface of the water. And that's essentially um, uh, surface tension. So think about like this ball right here. Imagine that it's super light made of like styrofoam. It floats on the water, but the water does wrap around it. There is surface tension where the red part is because it's like being separated but not breaking just yet. Um, so there's a, like a really funny picture that kind of floats around, but surface tension. So right before the swimmer's head breaks the water into the air, you have this tension of water um, that interacts with each other through hydrogen bonding. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cohesion and adhesion. So in the beginning, we talked about the skill. One of the skills is to look at a picture and determine um, how that relates to 1.1, which is hydrogen bonding structure of water. Where is cohesion and adhesion present in this image? So I'd pause it, write it down. That's what you should be doing right now. Okay, cohesion and adhesion. So you have cohesion, the water being all together, adhesion. Um, so this right here is a capillary tube. Just think about like a tube being placed into the beaker of water. So water's going to rise up the tube. You may uh, be familiar with like when you stick a straw into the drink, sometimes like the fluid goes up the straw. Um, so cohesion is the water to water, the water molecules to water molecules. Now, if you look at this, image sometimes you'll notice that uh, what you'll see is that there's this uh, u-shape sometimes when you're let's say pipetting um, you'll see that there's like a u-shape when you look at it and you try to determine how many moles you have inside the pipette and you're looking at like the bottom of that u-shape now it does rise up a bit on the sides the reason why it rises up on the sides is because the charge inside the water molecules is being attracted to the sides of the capillary tube. Now, as a result, it's gonna adhere or stick to the sides. And because they are two unlike substances, the water and the capillary tube, whatever it's made of, um, essentially it's going to uh, stick. They're adhering to different surfaces. So that would be adhesion, cohesion, similar things, so water. And in real life, hydrogen bonding is super important as well as its properties to allow cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. Cohesion allows the water molecules to interact together and also like, create surface tension. So if you look at this little bug thing right here, insect, um, it's sticking to the top of the water. And it allows organisms to interact with water in this way because there is surface tension that allows it to not break through, but still rest on top and create that tension. Cohesion and adhesion keeps your plants alive. So how plants get water is through the xylem. Um, think about it like going through the roots to the xylem into the leaves and they're traveling. So when, you're, when you have water and it's moving up the xylem, um, that's essentially cohesion, water to water, and adhesion, water to the uh, xylem of the plant. Now, this then begs an interesting question. What does this mean about the charge of the xylem plants? So this is where we take our content knowledge of water and its properties and try to think about how that relates to how it interacts with the world. So I want you to think about how that relates to the uh, whoops, how that relates to uh, just the charge of the xylem, or if there is a charge. 
and I want you to explain why with your thinking and reasoning. So you can pause the video over here. Okay, so what you should have got is that the water we know is polar. In order for water to stick to something else, it, the other thing has to also be charged or polar. Um, just think about it like if it was not polar, it'd be like oil and water. It wouldn't want to interact. But because uh, we know that the xylem is polar, we know this because water can travel up it and adhere to the cell wall of it. Um, as a result, we can definitively say that the xylem is actually charged because it interacts with the water and allows the water to adhere to it. Two different surfaces. We have the surface of the water, um, or we have the water interacting with the surface of the cell wall of the xylem. And if you uh, dive deep into the research of it, we would find that it actually has a negative plasma membrane, I believe because of chloride. Um, so that allows that negative charge in the, uh, in the plasma membrane of it. And we know that negative charge interacts with the partially positive charge of the oxygen. So that essentially wraps up um, the properties of water and how that uh, allows for hydrogen bonding and how hydrogen bonding also relates to cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension, and how surface tension plays a role in interaction with uh, life as we know it, and why that's so important to life.